Hello, I'm Peter Blackwood. I'm coordinator of the Uniting Church in Australia's Icon Schools. Each year, Philip Davidov and Olga Shalomova from St. Petersburg, two contemporary Russian iconographers, visit Melbourne and conduct classes. This year, in January uh, 2019, the Icon Schools invited uh, Philip and Olga to spend an afternoon with us and they generously uh, provided uh, a, a wonderful uh, program of lecture and demonstration. Uh, in this second episode or chapter of uh, Philip Davidov's uh, lecture he talks of Peter the Great and the development of iconography through to the time of the Russian Revolution in the early part of the 20th century. Here we jump to another part of our lecture, and that's again the end of the great time. So having seen these huge constructions all gilded over, he probably wasn't really fond of wasting time for decoration, because he was himself a great worker. He is known for going to Dutch, I don't know, ship industry to learn how to build the ships. Mm. He is known for really working hard building the new city, and therefore he more appreciated people working with their hands rather than going to a church with a huge screen. He transformed the church to one of the ministries, to one of official departments of the state and many, many other changes, but that is the iconostasis in his favorite church of Peter and Paul Fortress in the center of St. Petersburg. So I would say it's not very tall, yes, the height of a human being would be like that. It's gilded, but it's mostly transparent. So traveling so many times to Holland and other places, he probably was very much influenced by Protestant culture, rather opening the sacrament to humans than hiding it between the huge trees. So that probably was the approach he had, and that influenced also the way the churches were done. This is the same church, just a little longer. So it for me does not look anymore like a traditional Orthodox church with very strict and disciplined form doesn't either look as a more contemporary Orthodox church of 16th century with huge amount of gilding. It's something new. It's a new involvement of the church culture having little important part decorated, but all the rest constructed according to some model of a Protestant church with enough space for everybody to sit, to listen, yes, very special thing which we never had in Russian churches mm -hmm. before, and everything's changing. So yes, Peter was right, Peter, Peter the Great brought many different changes. And that is one of these changes, when they borrowed the model from Peter and Paul Fortress, it started uh, using it in many other places, and this actually is a royal gate in Yaroslav representing the Last Supper. So there are very few other models like that, but this could not be happening in any early churches in Russia. They may have put images under dependence of huge decorations, but they would never transform the altar, the, the, the royal gate into something like that, which would more be like an explaining tool for humans attending the church than just being a sacred image. So this, I feel, is a huge Protestant influence towards the Russian Christian culture. And the images changed as well, and of course the artists who had to paint them were trying to find their commissions and had to obey the taste of the people. And a very interesting fact which we know that this image, which currently 
most professionals would say it would rather it should rather be named like some Italian Madonna used to be icon of a very famous Russian saint of later times who is Seraphine of Sarah. So how come is the question because many people would say like oh these Western images are not good because they don't help pray. But again, this is a great example of how having a very westernized image built according to realistic and again rather Catholic tradition values was a whole image for prayer for someone who became a well-known saint. So if you want to be a saint, you can gain a name like that. Or vice versa, he probably became a saint just trying to struggle to pray with this image. We never know, but it's just an important thing that an icon does have the requirements, but requirements don't guarantee that you're becoming a saint or not. So, yes, the artist who had to work in the church started adjusting their styles to the new requirements of Peter the Great's time and other things like that. And they began producing images more Western time rather than Eastern and medieval in fine art academies. And in St. Petersburg we have a special faculty in fine art academy, which since the very beginning has the name of Religious and Historic Paintings, Department of Religious and Historical Paintings. And most of the time I've talked to the guys who studied here from like 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. they draw the how do you say sketches, they make like drawings from different people, human beings, from people who work to demonstrate their bodies as how they are constructed. And only after like 4 p.m. they are allowed to study of how the ancient churches were built. So coming back to the ancient churches and things which are now available to us, we should remember many generations of Christians in Russia and other countries didn't have them available because most Russian icons or in other countries as well got covered with the linseed oil or boiled linseed oil, which with time gets darker. And in many cases, they would simply just try to renew the image, applying one more layer of linseed oil, which may have for 2, 3, 5, 15 years. But then, it gets even darker than it was before. And on the type of the imagery, you can see that it belongs to the 18th century. And here is Peter the Great, yes? But even such a late image with addition of the linseed oil has evolved so much, has darkened so much, so that made it invisible or unreadable for the future generations. And that happened everywhere, and this is again, I think it's in the 19th century. Under the glaze or under the linseed oil varnish and without it. So the process when this Rediscovery started, we can put it about the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century. Because that's when in other countries as well, people started appreciation, appreciating more what their ancient predecessors produced in ancient Greece or in medieval France and finally Duke and many other people at the time were part of the movement. And being part of the movement restores, removed, huge amount of the linseed oil. <laughs> so they did rediscover these treasures for us, for some, for like two, three generations before us, because nobody would have seen this image of John the Baptist for five hundred years. <laughs> it was there, but it was hidden. <laughs> and that was such a very special process which many people participated and many artists, I would say, were inspired by what was happening. Like here is one of the trinities, one of the icons painted by, again by the Simon Ushakov 
and some very curious restorer occasionally scratched the surface. And what he found was a 14th century item. So that was a very common practice of painting one item on top of another. And very often they would even confuse the subjects. Like in one of the churches we know that fresco painted in 19th century had like set an order of apostles on the last, sup last supper, but when 20 years ago the restorers started removing it, removing the linseed oil on top of which the last layer was painted, they've just shifted the heads. So one had the beard instead of not having it. That means these artists didn't see it. They had the freedom of repainting it the way they wanted, simply because that was easier to paint on top rather than to clean, especially because they didn't have the solvents we have in our hardware stores. So they just resolved questions how they could, and that's what was happening. So rediscovery was a great inspirational process of the beginning of the 20th century, and many artists in Russia and I know, of course, the West as well, but Russians got very inspired by what they started to see unseen for hundreds of years. <coughs> and, of course, it was not very easy to shift immediately from academical training they would have in Fine Art Academy to drop Christ realistically, but they tried to learn with what they could, or with what they were able to, how to approach, how to learn, how to follow these predecessors and what they did as their artists. And these were the items created in the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, you can say it's an art nouveau, but the sources of this inspiration were, for my very humble opinion, in the rediscovery of the images, and not just the images, but the entire culture of medieval time. So that's probably one of the last images of this lecture. I can make a short or long or hyper long break, and then we can move to the 20th century if you like to. Well known name is Vasnetov, who did paint some churches, and these, I feel it may generally be named as an ornamental style, but it's technically more rich thing. So he was taking, he was trying to take these very solid ideal models, but treated them in a more contemporary way for his time. He tried to build them up in, as more living creatures, at the same time attributing to them more monumentality than the people who painted the realistic painting. And this is one of his sketches he had for a church painting, and that's the real church which is still available for visiting. I think it's in Kiev, Ukraine. But again, it's something you do recognize, it's not just a naturalistic painting, it's something based on medieval time with very subtle shifts towards the contemporary art. And there were other artists who tried to get inspired with the new discoveries and art below discoveries and worked for the churches. So they were many very promising things which could have flourished everywhere in Russia. Like this is not far from Moscow and it is made of Maiolic or how you call the ceramic. Yes. It's painted on ceramic and it's applied with tile. And why not? Because on the distance, you don't really see the eyelashes on the figures. <laughs> you see the grand image. And as an architecture image, it works well. And there were many other places and churches like this, or different types, which sometimes survive, sometimes do not. But they are the testimony about this beginning of flourishing of contemporary at that time religious art. This is one of the churches built in 1913 and recently restored and these guys were very good in trying to be very delicately restoring of what 
was produced by predecessors. So at the first glance, we see this as a medieval thing, as a doorway to some cathedral in France or in Russia. But looking more carefully and closer, you'll notice that all the patterns and the very approach to the shape, to the form, is different. It has changed because the very human being evolved. So the life of the human has changed and therefore they couldn't repeat anymore what had been done 800 years ago. They had to reinvent the medieval art in order to make it their own medieval art. And that's what was happening. And that's what we can be proud of even though afterwards many things were destroyed. So almost medieval, but not yet. So it's very interesting event. Many good things were created in Moldova. They had lots of good properties, but though even though they are very contemporary, and yeah, you would have lots of things like that, even in Melbourne and in England, many places. That's how an iconosis in this church would look like, even now. And I ask you to look of what the proportions of what is the relationship between the gilded construction and the dark icons. Even if these icons were painted in the beginning of the 20th century, so recently, they were painted dark because these artists knew icon has to be dark. <laughs> that was the stereotype given by hundreds of years and hundreds of icons they would have seen in their churches and that's how it would look like. So very a lot of luminosity in the images on the walls, but very dusk colors on the eyes. Just because of these are just together. That's how they said. So it's a real photograph of Patriar Serial from a lot of years ago. So we see the eyes, but they're way too muted compared to the rest of the environment. And these guys at the beginning of the 20th century were sponsored by a royal court and they even tried to hire, and they did hire, the best artists of the time to produce drawings and design for the westerns. There are not many remained, but they at least published a couple of catalogues of what their production was, which are now very helpful because Father Zenon and other ethnographers can copy from them and say it's a very nice and contemporary thing from just being able to have a source. So this is a wonderful source. And you see, again, it's a drawing, it's a project for an iconosis somewhere in Russia. And you see just in, in the project already, the icons are treated as something which you don't really a feel able to distinguish. So you have to be dark. That's because the stereotype of that. And when we see the catalog, we'll see things like this. So very abstracted and bidimensional parts connected to realistically painted faces and features and, and garments, simply because that was the pattern of the time. That was the approach of an artist who would have oh, sorry, for would have worked this time. This we have in our Museum of Religion and the History of Religion. And if no one tells you, I bet most of you would have said it's an early Christian thing. Because very much it looks by its shape of how it was inspired. And even though we feel it is not because of particular qualities we can capture from there. Very medieval but very romantic and more contemporary at the same time. And again, many bad things happen, and we can only speak about the rest of what was not ruined and what just somehow survived after these massive losses 